Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with the exciting conclusion of our little overview of the Chinese Civil War. As we begin this episode, early 1949, the last of the three great campaigns of 1948-49, the Ping Jin, is over and practically all of China north of the Yangtze is in CCP hands. As 1949 dawned, there was this hope among many in China that their country's long slide from greatness that began in the 1830s was finally coming to an end. For more than a century, the Chinese people had witnessed and experienced national suffering on a mass scale and political humiliation at the hands of more powerful nations. The cities and the countryside had witnessed some of the 20th century's worst cases of man's inhumanity to man. And finally, since about the time of the Daoguang Emperor, this pain and suffering seemed like it was just about coming to an end. After the three great campaigns of 1948, the Liaoshen, Huai Hai, and Ping Jin, there was this air of inevitability now about an ultimate CCP victory and that the times they were a-changing. There was this lull in the action right after the Ping Jin campaign came to an end in January 1949. Man, these guys were exhausted. The CCP and KMT armies had been mauling each other for three hard years since 1946. The PLA had taken the north, and now it was time to go conquer the rest of China. And this involved crossing the Yangtze River. I've said it many times in past CHP episodes, this long river always served as the geographic boundary dividing China in half. These two regions, north and south of this river, had at first developed independently of each other, and then later, the two distinct cultures became one. We saw in the CHP 111 episode covering the Wu State one of the ways this happened. Things were looking grimmer than ever before for the KMT. But Jiang Kai-shek, he was like the Black Knight in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. No matter how beaten he was... He just pretend like the Huai Hai campaign only caused a scratch. He spent much of 1949 flying all over China to meet with his generals and loyalists in his most desperate hours, and there were quite a few in 1949. He even flew to the Philippines and South Korea to try and rally the anti-communist leaning governments there to his defense. From his diaries, and he, he was a prolific diarist, it was clear... Jiang knew the end was coming, but he didn't give up just yet. As I mentioned, there was this few-month lull between the end of the Ping Jin campaign in January 49 and the crossing of the Yangtze in April. First of all, with the job now finished in the north and in Manchuria, Lin Biao didn't need to stick around up there. To move a massive army from the north of China down into the heartland required a little time. So these few months gave Lin the time he needed to get into place to enter the next and hopefully final phase of this civil war. Mao bided his time in Xi Bai Po, toying with China's acting president, Li Zongren. He made this great show of willingness to cooperate and find some kind of reasonable settlement. But Mao, of course, had no intention of ever cutting a deal with acting President Li or anyone from the KMT. Li Zongren didn't have much to bargain with except the willingness to go quietly, which would mitigate the potential bloodshed. There was going to be no question that the Yangtze had to be crossed. And back in 1949, this was no narrow stream that was easy for one person to cross, let alone an army of well over a million men. Chen Yi's deputy, Su Yu, was tasked with coming up with a plan. He had to figure out how to cross, where to cross, and when. To put Li Zongren's feet to the fire, Mao came up with his terms for surrender. This so-called eight-point plan was harsh, didn't offer the nationalists any breaks. And why should he offer them any wiggle room? Mao had them right where he wanted them. Damned if they did, damned if they didn't. The eight points of surrender were, one, punish all war criminals, two, abolishing the 1947 Constitution, three, abolishing the KMT's whole legal system, 
Four, reorganizing the nationalist armies. Five, confiscation of all government capital. Six, land reform. Seven, abolishing all treasonous treaties. And eight, convene a political consultative conference to form a coalition government. President Lee had sent a peace mission to Mao's headquarters in Shibaipo in Hebei. This mix of negotiators weren't holding too many aces up their sleeves, so in the end, they just signed off on all eight points. And this didn't go over too well with Li Zongren, and it certainly wasn't welcome news when Chiang Kai-shek heard of it. They thought a deal could be struck. After Mao gave Li Zongren five days to accept or else, Li told Mao's negotiators to go stuff it, and that became the official pretext to cross the Yangtze and launch the invasion of the South on April 20th, 1949. Li Zongren's refusal to play ball under Mao's rules was the mechanism that got everything going. The PLA had more than a million and a half soldiers camped out on the north banks of the Yangtze. According to Su Yu's plans, there were to be three advance groups that would cross the Yangtze at three different locales. And these three places would be at Hukou, near Jiujiang in Jiangxi province, as well as Jiangyin, north of Wuxi, and Pukou, across from the capital in Nanjing. These three advance groups were led by the same go-to guys that all the big jobs went to, Chen Yi, Lin Biao, and Liu Bocheng. The crossing of the Yangtze, well, this is one of the great historic and theatrical moments of the whole Civil War. If you remember from that Deng Xiaoping series, Ezra Vogel had mentioned that Deng considered this one of his greatest moments ever. In some places where the PLA crossed, the whole thing went without incident. No one was there to stop them. They just crossed. 300,000 PLA troops crossed over a 24-hour period. In other places, it was like Saving Private Ryan. Nationalist troops lined up on the south side, just mowing down the crossing PLA with heavy doses of machine gun fire. But the crossing of the Yangtze was done, and then a few days later on April 23rd, Lin Biao's forces entered Nanjing, the capital of the Republic of China. All traces of KMT soldiers had left the city. The mayor had left the city by car, taking with him 300 million Chinese yuan. Once he got out of the city, though, his bodyguards beat him up and ripped him off for all the cash and left him on the side of the road. Then the negotiating team that Li Zongren had sent to discuss surrender terms ended up defecting to the communists, and that was that. Acting President Li Zongren, recognizing the inevitable flood of PLA troops into Nanjing, had first fled to Hangzhou. From there, he implored Jiang Kai-shek to send help and get back in the fight. Jiang had done little to support Li after he had gone and dumped the nation's troubles in his lap. After all, what could Jiang do? Send what forces? The Generalissimo had seemingly by this time lost all his will to fight, and more often than not, whatever Li Zongren would order would soon after be countermanded by Jiang. After the PLA took Nanjing, there was a famous story about how Deng Xiaoping and Chen Yi were both goofing on Jiang Kai-shek, having fun sitting in the Generalissimo's presidential chair in the palace. After it got too hot for Li Zongren in Hangzhou, he flew to his stronghold of Guangxi, to his hometown of Guilin. He was a former warlord from that region. Like many warlords, he had thrown his lot in with Jiang and the KMT before the northern expedition. Li flew next to Guangzhou, trying to run the government from there, so Li Zongren, despite his best efforts, couldn't get a handle on the situation. And besides, whatever he tried to do, Li Zongren was often stymied by Jiang, who seemingly worked systematically against the acting president. Once Guangzhou was taken by the PLA, Li went to Chongqing, and it's there in that former wartime capital where Li Zongren and the KMT government made their last stand. But by this time, this, this Guangxi warlord and KMT general and now acting president of the ROC had had enough. He decided at this point to throw in the towel, surrender to his bleeding ulcers, and then he flew to the Big Apple to have his duodenal 
problems checked out at New York Presbyterian Hospital. The Civil War was over for him. While all this drama was going on, something goes down in the middle of the Yangtze River that sent a nice little shockwave that was felt in many Western capitals. This was known as the Yangtze Incident. Now, over the course of 4,000 years of Chinese history, probably many incidents happened on that 3,900-mile long river. So, for something to go down in history as the Yangtze Incident, it had to be big. Well, it wasn't really that big, and maybe some of my British listeners might be familiar with it. Ma was paranoid as hell that in crossing the Yangtze and then going in for the kill, this was going to trigger an immediate American response that would come at the last second and spoil everything for him. So he had to send a signal to the imperialists that he meant business. Just as the communists were ready to carry out this crossing of the Yangtze, a British gunboat, the HMS Amethyst, was heading from Shanghai to Nanjing, carrying a load of supplies to the British Embassy. On April 20th, 1949, right around the city of Jiangyin, a PLA mortar battery opened fire on the vessel. When Mao was told of an imperialist gunboat sailing up the Yangtze near to where he planned to cross, he said, uh, I don't think so. Mao, wanting to show these imperialist days were over, gave orders to Su Yu to fire on the Amethyst as well as the frigate HMS Consort that had rushed to her aid. Actually, he was going to tell General Su to hold fire, but it was already too late. During the firefight, the Amethyst ran aground mid-river on a sandbank. Mao then told Su Yu to wait and see if they tried anything funny before he opened up on them again. Around 50 British were killed or wounded in the confrontation. On April 28, 1949, the four-year anniversary of Mussolini's death, Mao had told his generals, quote, The incidents with the British warships have shaken the world and became the headlines of all the main newspapers in Britain and America. Well, not that the PRC was established yet, but this wasn't the best way to start new Sino-British relations. But Mao was looking to make a point to these Western powers who he feared were possibly looking to cause trouble. And he used this incident with the HMS Amethyst on the Yangtze to make his point. Each time the ship tried to do something to make a getaway, PLA batteries would open up on it. For ten weeks, the PLA guarded this beleaguered British vessel as negotiations between the two sides took place. In fact, one of the men involved in the negotiations with someone we discussed in the History of Hong Kong Part 10 episode. This was Hong Kong's future 26th governor, Sir Edward Yode. His attempts at negotiating the release of the amethyst with the PLA all came to naught. Then on the evening of July 30th, 1949, the amethyst made a daring attempt to escape. The vessel began heading east towards relative safety in Shanghai, 104 miles away. By now, the Yangtze on both sides of the river belonged to the communists, so they had to make a very nerve-wracking attempt to make it out alive. The Amethyst followed a passing merchant ship called the Qiangling Liberation. They stayed close to this vessel, using it for cover, hoping that it wouldn't attract much, if any, notice, especially so late at night. But no such luck. They were spotted, and in the confusion, the Qiangling Liberation was sunk, suffering many losses. By the morning, however, the Amethyst had made its tense and amazing getaway to Baoshan and Wusong at the mouth of the Yangtze. This daring getaway was led by Lieutenant Commander John Cairns. Cairns would later be portrayed by actor and World War II vet Richard Todd in the 1957 British film The Yangtze Incident. After a very intense escape, the Amethyst headed south along the China coast to safety in Hong Kong. The message sent by Karens was sort of worth repeating. After he had made his mad dash to safety, he signaled to a British vessel, quote, have rejoined the fleet south of Wusong. No damage, no casualties. God save the king, unquote. As the PLA flooded the zone south of the Yangtze, the nationalists made their final stand in Chongqing. 
Once the Yangtze had been crossed and the defeat became more imminent, the KMT-led government from Chiang Kai-shek to Li Zongren and all the way down to the last man began to self-destruct at a faster rate. You know, the KMT leadership, both politically and militarily, was always a rather fragmented lot. Chiang Kai-shek was never a Chairman Mao as far as commanding loyalty went. Once Mao was in charge following the Long March, that was it. He was in charge, and he didn't have to constantly look over his shoulder for some Brutus or Cassius amongst his followers. Not Chiang Kai-shek. He hardly trusted anyone, and his generals had their own personal alliances and rivalries. And business interests, too. They had thrown their lot in with this one or that one, and now at this 11th hour, as the entire house of cards was collapsing, everyone was literally running for their lives or looking for a safe place to hide out. Well, after Nanjing fell, the next two big places to go were Nanchang in Jiangxi and Hangzhou in Zhejiang. Hangzhou back then was about a one or two day march to Shanghai, so that city was buckling down for the imminent arrival of the PLA. There was this dread about their arrival into the city. But at the same time, a lot of Shanghainese capitalists who chose to remain behind felt, despite the fears of many, that no matter what, their social class would still be necessary under the new regime. The wheels of commerce and international trade would be as important in the new China as it had always been. So a lot of Shanghainese, rather than desert the sinking ship, decided to stick around and sit on the fence to see what their fate might be under the communists. Anyone who had somewhere else to go by this time in April, May 1949 was already long gone. Many believe that regardless of their perceived value under the new regime, the talons of Leninism were going to penetrate too deeply and it was best to get out while the going was not necessarily good, but better than it was shaping up to be. It was also this time, March, April, May of 1949, that thousands of stateless Europeans, including so many Jews who had found refuge in Shanghai, were desperately searching for some country, any country, to come to their aid and grant them passports. Two nations in particular that came forward were uh, the Philippines and Costa Rica. The man tasked with defending Shanghai for the nationalists was General Tang Enbo, Tang Enbo was one of Chiang Kai-shek's main generals, not only for fighting the communists, but the Japanese as well during the War of Resistance. Jiang wasn't entirely trusting of Tang after Tang had informed on his teacher and fellow nationalist army stalwart Chen Yi. Chen, as we discussed before in part one of this series, was the one in charge during the 228 incident that went down in the streets of Taipei. After Tang Anbo informed Jiang that Chen Yi had approached him about defecting to the communist side, Jiang immediately arrested Chen and he was later executed. You'd think Tang Anbo might have earned a modicum of trust from CKS for informing on Chen Yi, but instead the suspicious Jiang mistrusted Tang more than ever and kept a close eye on him. As the PLA started to close in on Shanghai in May of 1949, Word got out that General Tang, through his intermediaries, had made a down payment on a 22-room mansion in Tokyo that, in Jiang's eyes, revealed his duplicity. And Jiang is going to wonder if Tang Anbo's secret plans to flee to Japan had any relationship with how easy Shanghai ended up falling to the communists. Even Du Yuesheng himself, who provided all that local muscle that carried out the Shanghai Massacre all those years ago. Even he was trying to cut some kind of deal with the communists. Zhou Enlai, who by this time had seen everything, was completely amazed at Big Air Du's audacity. Tang Anbo tried his best to hold on to Shanghai for the nationalists. Everything by now was spiraling out of control as far as even a minor semblance of normalcy. By now, there was... No currency. If you wanted to carry out a financial transaction, big or small, only gold would do at this point. Just before the PLA came to liberate the city, to show who was in charge and perhaps to do something desperate rather than just sit around and wait, 
Pang Anbo took a page out of Big Air Du's book and carried out a mini Shanghai massacre of his own. Some of you may have seen these photos and black and white videos of these squads out in the street forcing young students, presumably communist sympathizers, down on their knees right in the middle of the streets and in Joppe Park, popping them right in the back of the head. It was like the last days of Berlin and World War II or Saigon in April of 75. Gangs of these soldiers were sent out executing anyone and everyone they could get their hands on who wasn't on the KMT side. There were even these anti-communist parades organized on the Bund to try and shore up whatever remaining support there was for the nationalist government. There had been this hope that the transfer of power in Shanghai, that everyone knew would happen, would happen peacefully without any shots being fired. All kinds of secret talks were going on that might facilitate this. But then at the end of April, just as there seemed a peaceful transfer might take place, Chiang Kai-shek flew into Shanghai vowing to defend the city to the end and all hopes for this peaceful regime change in China's most important city went out the window. Chiang only stayed a short time and left again on May 8th, but his presence there and attempts at rallying the forces did its damage. It was at this time when all hopes of a peaceful and easy transition went south that Du Yuesheng cashed in his chips and fled the country, flying to Hong Kong, where he would die a couple years later, many say from all the long-term effects of the life of depravity he lived for over two decades. So the communist forces, awaiting their marching orders, paused as their leaders, Chen Yi and Deng Xiaoping, figured out what to do. They didn't want to fight their way into the city and cause all kinds of mass casualties and all the political fallout that goes with that. In the end, the Shanghai business community had to pass the hat to raise enough funds to pay Tang Anbo off to get out of Shanghai. Tang headed to Guangzhou, and his army did its best to disappear into the masses of crowds. There were some skirmishes on the outskirts of the city that slowed down the taking of Shanghai, but take it the PLA did. On May 25th, at the stroke of midnight, the PLA, camped outside the city, began marching in peacefully. There was no resistance as they entered, arguably, China's greatest and most important city in the 20th century. The day before, a huge portrait of Chairman Mao had been hung right on the marquee of the Great World Entertainment Center on Yan'an and Xizang roads, right where today's Da Shijie Station is located. This building had served as the city's premier entertainment and amusement center since 1917. There's also a story that mentioned uh, the greatest star of the day, the ravishingly beautiful Yan Hui Zhu, who it was told, shed all her glamour and came out into the streets dressed like a commoner to enthusiastically greet the PLA soldiers personally. She was amongst those who decided not to flee and to embrace the CCP. But 17 years later, in 1966, she will be hounded into committing suicide during the Cultural Revolution. The disciplined cadres all fanned out throughout the city, taking over government buildings, seizing any KMT documents, and figuring out where all the levers of power were so they could start controlling them. It was sort of a great cultural moment, too, as all these PLA soldiers who, for the most part, were, were not educated city dwellers from Jiangsu or Zhejiang. They were mostly illiterate northerners from north of that long river. And for them to march into this magnificent city with all its marble, limestone, and all the most modern technologies and conveniences in all of China just made their jaws drop. And these sophisticated urbanites just got a kick out of these worn-out-looking, battle-hardened hicks from the countryside, carrying their guns and refusing offers for cigarettes or any kind of gift. They hardly looked like the menace that they had been told to expect. In fact, despite their weapons that they carried, these PLA soldiers seemed rather harmless in the eyes of these city folk. Well, the guy who was made Shanghai's first mayor was none other than Chen Yi himself. You could see his statue today located on the choicest part of the Bund, the part where all the tourists congregate. 
When Chen Yi entered Shanghai on that fateful day in May, the statue that occupied that space was none other than Sir Robert Hart, who we featured in episode CHP 58. Amazingly enough, after very strict measures that were backed up with a few bullets to the back of the head, and after a new currency was launched, Shanghai began to bounce back quite fast. There's nothing else the world of commerce dislikes more than uncertainty, but after a short period, things looked like they were going to recover just fine. There was an old story, it's mentioned in most of the sources I read, Tang Anbo ordered this huge moat to be built outside Shanghai that utilized a vast amount of wood and conscripted labor. He was building this moat ostensibly to hold back the PLA bearing down on Shanghai. However, the real story seems to be that Tang Anbo had this relative in the timber or building materials business who needed to get rid of all this wood and turn it into cash so he could make his getaway to Taiwan or wherever. Let me quote Jonathan Spence regarding what happened after the fall of Shanghai. Quote, In the following months, the communist armies moved to consolidate their hold with a speed for which there had been no parallel since the victories of the Manchus and their Chinese collaborators in 1645-1646. In 1949, there was plenty of action going on elsewhere. Peng De Huai had his band on the road as well, taking Xi'an first on May 20th and then heading westwards towards Xinjiang. Peng De Huai's mission was to take Gansu, Ningxia, and Qinghai. This meant he had to go head-to-head -head against one of the most reliable and fiercest KMT generals, Hu Zongnan. He hadn't quit the fight yet. Hu Zongnan, you remember, was the one who led the forces that took Yan An and chased Mao ultimately to his new base in Xibaipo. Also fighting alongside Hu Zongnan on the KMT side was someone we discussed in an old CHP episode, number 78, on the Xi base on Ma, the warlord Ma's of the Northwest. This was one of the main Ma's, Ma Bufang. His turf was Qinghai province. He and another of the main Ma's, Ma Hongkui, they joined hands late in the game to fight the communists and keep them out of the northwest. After Peng's forces had taken Xi'an, they took a big loss at Baoji, just west of Xi'an, losing 15,000 in that battle to forces led by Ma Bufang's cousin, Ma Hongkui. If you recall from that warlord Ma clique episode, these guys were as tough as nails and not the easy pushovers that was so often the case when the PLA fought against the NRA. Despite putting up a good fight, Ma Bu Fang's forces were ultimately unable to stop Peng's army. So after Lanzhou was taken in August, Ma Bu Fang saw the writing on the wall. He knew it was over for him as far as his fortunes in China were concerned. The Ma family, going back to the patriarchs, Ma Zhan Ao, Ma Qianling and Ma Haiyan had done well for themselves in northwest China since the days of the Hui Minority War of 1862 to 1877. By 1949, though, their luck had run out. So good old reliable Peng De Huai accomplished his mission. Ma Bu Fang fled first to Chongqing. From Chongqing, Ma Bu Fang flew to Hong Kong and then to Taiwan. And he remained a KMT party stalwart until his dying day in 1975. After Lanzhou was taken and Gansu belonged to the communists, Peng's next stop on the tour was in Xinjiang, where he accepted the surrender of the KMT armies there in September. Lin Biao, in the meantime, was making all kinds of progress mopping up in the heartland. After he took Changsha and Hunan on August 22nd, he headed due south, marching towards Guangzhou, after Mao had already stood at the Tiananmen podium on 10-1, Lin Biao took both Xiaoman and Guangzhou on October 28th. Up to that point, Xiaoman had been the main jumping-off point to anyone looking for greener pastures in Taiwan. Now the place belonged to the communists, and that way out of Dodge was now closed. 
Well, it sort of went like this. Uh, one by one, all these places were taken. Guizhou by mid-November, and then finally the last bastion of the Republic of China, the city of Chongqing, was taken by December 1st. After Chiang Kai-shek left Shanghai on May 8th, he had flown to Taiwan to go see how things were going. Back in the days of the Sino-Japanese War, Jiang was often accused of not fighting the Japanese in order to preserve his troop strength against the communists. Now, in this late stage, as the PLA was finishing off the job and total collapse of the nationalist command structure had already happened, Jiang was now being accused of not fighting the communists for the sake of preserving his troops for the ultimate move to Taiwan. By now, of course, Jiang knew this is where he was going to end up. He knew he would need to stay in Taiwan until he could get his act together, carry out some major political and social reform, try and snag the USA into backing him again, and then when the time was right, invade China and put everything back to the way it was before Japan came and ruined everything in the 1930s. His guy there in Taiwan was Chen Cheng, who he had made governor. Chen and Jiang spent some time together holed up in Yangming Shan discussing how things had gone up till now and planned for the future. Utilizing their green gang links to the very end, it was the strong backs of these gangsters that loaded up all the treasures, wealth, and assets that could be ferried out of China and shipped to Taiwan. They did an absolutely superb job of emptying the coffers and taking anything of value to the island that wasn't nailed down. Taiwan had been softened up since the 228 incident that we spoke of earlier. Once it became a foregone conclusion that Taiwan was in Jiang's future, the place needed to be totally set up so that when the end came, Jiang could step out of one pair of shoes and into another. Unfortunately, the KMT takeover of the island was a violent one. Jiang Kai-shek had given this task to Chen Yi, who was promptly relieved of duty soon after he accomplished his mission. Jiang needed a hard-ass like Chen Yi to do the dirty job of pacifying any resistance on Taiwan against the KMT regime. But once this was more or less accomplished, Jiang put more moderate people in place. And as I said, Jiang ended up executing Chen Yi after Tang Anbo informed on him. Jiang had dumped all the problems of the government on Li Zongren so that he could focus on this next phase of the Republic of China. He knew that after Shanghai fell, the mass exodus of mainlanders to Taiwan was going to be huge. And these mainlanders, Jiang considered his core base. So the more who came, the better. The Japanese had already primed the pump as far as putting most of the necessary infrastructure in place. This was going to be very convenient for the KMT takeover of the levers of power. Jiang ended up fleeing to Taiwan on December 10th, 1949. When Deng Xiaoping and his army got too close for comfort in Chongqing, Jiang flew at once to Chengdu. And it's there that the Generalissimo Jiang Kai-shek with Deng's forces closing in on this Sichuan capital, finally used that one-way ticket to Taipei that he had always kept safe in his back pocket. Whilst in Chengdu, just before fleeing, Jiang gave orders to execute every single one of his political opponents, whoever was in KMT custody or whoever could be got at. With the exception of several pacification campaigns to put down pockets of resistance in Xinjiang and Tibet in 1950, it was all over as far as the Chinese Civil War was concerned. Mao Zedong had already written about the way it was going to be from now on. Remember, he had called for this consultative conference in September. This body churned out what was known as the Common Program, the Gong Tong Gangling. This common program was Mao's blueprint for the brave new world that he was planning on building. Mao called for the broad masses to all join together to build this united front that would be led by the working class. Everybody was going to be in on this. The peasants, the petty bourgeoisie, and the national bourgeoisie as well. They too were invited to get in on the action. So all these groups together 
like I said, would join with the workers who would lead the whole thing. And this would form what was known as the People's Democratic Dictatorship. And you know who would lead them. Get it? This was Mao's big picture as he started to move ahead with implementation of things that had been, up to now, so easy to theorize about on paper. While still in Shibai Po, Mao had met with Stalin's man, Anastas Mikoyan, and those two used that time to work out the whole blueprint for the future Sino-Soviet cooperation. In these very productive meetings in early 1949, not only did they discuss brass tacks with regard to the nature of the relationship, but also regarding their future cooperation on the international stage, Mao still hadn't had his face-to-face sit-down with Stalin, much to his frustration, but he felt okay in the afterglow of these meetings with Mikoyan. Mao decided in the spring of 1949 that the time had come to stop roughing it in Xipaipo, and so he started heading in the direction of Beijing. It was Mao who acted as the decider regarding where the leadership would cluster itself. Mao decided they would live inside the historic Zhongnanhai compound adjacent to the Forbidden City. Therefore, he called for his people to get the whole place fixed up and readied for the eventual arrival of the new nation's highest leaders. While the CCP's Zhongnanhai compound was being built, Mao set up temporary digs in the fragrant hills west of Beijing. There he waited with all his men until September, when the leadership compound was completed. Then, Ma moved into Zhongnanhai and prepared for his big announcement. He wanted to wait to proclaim the founding of the new nation until October, the month that the Russian Revolution had taken place and the Xinhai Revolution as well. October 1st, 1949 was a cold day in Beijing. Ma was going to make his symbolic announcement on the gate of heavenly peace and declare that the Chinese people had stood up and the People's Republic of China was founded. There were plenty of places within eyesight of the podium where a sniper with a high-power rifle could build a nest and at the right moment pick off China's new leaders on the podium one by one. The security detail was frantic, trying to convince Mao to do something a little more low-key. But despite the risks, Mao wouldn't be swayed. This was too symbolic and too perfect of a place for what he was about to say. He was going to follow in the footsteps of men like Liu Bang, Li Shermin, Zhao Kuangyin, and Zhu Yuanzhang for something this big. Mao figured he'd take his chances. Back then, Tiananmen Square wasn't the size that it is today. Depending on which version you read... Either tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands showed up to hear Mao speak those historic words. Mao appeared on this Tiananmen viewing platform many times over the course of the next 27 years that he would rule China. He'd utter the occasional slogans or witty phrase, but this speech that he gave on October 1st, 1949 would be the only one he would ever give atop the gate of heavenly peace. So Mao had his great moment, and the PRC was established. It'll be the 64th anniversary this year. This was also Mao's first moment in front of such a big crowd. One source I read mentioned that he wasn't well that day, and that the chairman was often very uncomfortable around people he wasn't familiar with. So he was a little tense and nervous and couldn't relax. The fighting in China would carry on until 1950, and then... So soon into the history of the PRC in October of that year, China would send troops to fight against American soldiers in Korea. You know, after the fall of Xuzhou during the Huaihai campaign, between 1,000 and 2,000 survivors of the KMT army made their way west through Sichuan, Yunnan, and into North Burma, to the Shan State. From this base, these ex-KMT soldiers, using guerrilla tactics tried a couple times to invade Yunnan without success. This group later came to the attention of the American CIA, who by 1951 was sending aid to these former Huai Hai campaign survivors, using them as a ragtag first line of defense against any 
possible incursions by Mao into Southeast Asia. Basically, these guys set themselves up in Burma, got into the opium trade, and later on, a guy named Zhang Qifu came along and would train under them. And this person, Zhang Qifu, became more well-known as the Opium King Kun Sha. That was one little legacy of the Chinese Civil War, among so many. And so, me little beauties, as Professor Bob in Kansas City always says, I hope you enjoyed that. The history of the War of Liberation, or the Chinese Revolution, or Chinese Civil War, whatever you want to call it, it's a great story. It serves as the final exclamation point to the end of China's century of humiliation. In past episodes of the CHP, we have looked at many of the things that have happened in China since 1949. Some good, some bad. It's hard to believe when you look at China today, with all its achievements and power, that less than a century before, the nation was a fragmented basket case on its knees, powerless to defend itself against imperialists and Japanese might. So knowing a little about what went down in China during the past 100 years truly can act as an ideal lens to view a lot of the issues we all read about today. In the context of more than 4,000 years of history, a century is nothing, not even 2%. So that's about it. Only took four episodes to tell this story because I left out about 90% of the details. There are a boatload of sidebars and other stories that I didn't mention in this series. For example, and listener Hunter pointed this out, the whole episode of Jiang Kai-shek's son and successor as president of the ROC, Jiang Qingguo, and his 12-year stint in the Soviet Union, a hostage-slash-guest of Joseph Stalin. I'm going to cover all this when I do the uh, Jiang Qingguo episode. For lovers of military strategy and hour-by-hour timelines of each and every battle, there is plenty for you to munch on. Contained in these four episodes were merely an overview of what happened. There are plenty of books out there that fill in all the fascinating details about what was going on in Nanjing, Beijing, Yan'an, Chongqing, Taipei, Shanghai, and Xibaipo. So for anyone whose appetite has not been sufficiently satiated. I encourage you to go read up more. There's also a ton of videos on the subject of the Civil War that you could find on YouTube and Yoku. That's all I have for you this time. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from, yes, the birthplace of Chiang Kai-shek, good old Ningbo, China. Well, he was actually from Shiko, but not too far away from where I'm sitting. I'm here once again visiting the head office. Be back in Claremont mid-month. So, from everyone here at the China History Podcast, our fine, dedicated staff of researchers, writers, editors, and brilliant engineers, I hope you'll join us next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.